Do people behave better when they're being watched? That's one of the many questions that's asked in this film that doesn't quite feel like a young adult dystopian world, but sort of like the prequel to that young adult dystopian world that we know. It's a movie that doesn't give you all of the answers, but instead poses questions, which isn't a bad thing. It sometimes feels like a parody, and even having read the book, it also feels incomplete. So for those of you who watch my videos, you know that I like going just beyond repeating the basic plot of the story, but getting into the themes and giving my explanation on what the movie is trying to ask, what the movie is trying to discuss. But of course, for those of you who may have not watched the movie, let me give you a quick breakdown leading up to that ending and what it was supposed to mean. So the plot. You have a massive company known as The Circle, which is like Google, Facebook, and it's pretty much not in Silicon Valley, it is Silicon Valley. And while the company does play a vital part in the movie, it's not the main focus of the movie. Instead, the film follows a 24-year-old woman named May who's tired of her dead-end job, she ain't feeling the boy who's waited 12 years to get with her, and is upset that she can't help her father who has a mess. Luckily though, she has a Scottish colleague named Annie who just so happens to be in the top 40 decision makers of the company, and she's able to get her in. She ends up meeting two of the three wise men who have built the company, Woody and Remy, who end up introducing Sea Change, which are these tiny 360 statistic-grabbing ultra-viewing cameras that they're mass producing to have all around the world and thus be able to see everything. This is where they argue that having an eye on everything will help activism and record when people are doing wrong without having to worry if you caught it on your phone. People still end up using their phones though. As creepy as these cameras are though, they do help rescue Mei when she decided to go Johnny Tsunami in the middle of the night, and because of this, she gets the attention of the top two, and instead of punishing her, they decide to use her as an example and give her the chance to make history by literally just becoming a YouTube vlogger. They call it going transparent where they attach those tiny cameras on her and they stream everything that she's doing except the three minute dookies she's allowed to take. They're like playing with Truman Show vibes with what they're trying to do but really it just ends up feeling like an extensive YouTube vlog just with less editing than they already do. Meanwhile, her friend Annie's going insane. And again, because this is based off of a book, they end up cutting a lot of it. And some of it was pretty important because she's not just having a bad hair day because she's working overtime. In the book, they actually have this thing called Past Perfect that looks at all of your ancestors and it turns out that hers are actually slave owners. On top of that, they also have footage of Annie's parents and they were watching a dude drown and they didn't do anything about it. So she's kind of like really freaking out that they're gonna make this public. That's what causes her to go crazy and end up in a coma in the book, whereas in the movie, she goes crazy but just ends up going back home to Scotland. Does May pay attention to this? Nah, she's already getting a lot of attention from all the viewers who watch her 24-7 livestream. She then starts to believe that any privacy is a criminal offense, that secrets are really lies, and that we behave bad when we're unaccountable, and she's pretty much just fully converted. Which is kind of crazy because when you look at it, obviously people want privacy because they don't want to be seen naked or taking a poop or any of that, but I guess there's some merit to it when you think back to like, Adam and Eve and how they were naked, but they didn't really realize that they were naked until they got that knowledge and the emotion of being embarrassed. So maybe the whole idea of privacy is crazy, maybe it's not. Either way, the company then begins to grow by focusing on voter laws, which out of all of the things that the company can do, pushing voter registration is like their number one priority, which to me has always been crazy because I've always wondered why people are always pushing others to vote but what ends up happening if you push someone to vote and they vote for the candidate you didn't want? Like, do you then retract what you were saying? Do you like stop asking people from Texas or California to vote? I it's always made me wonder why people do that. Either either way, the company gets bigger and they introduce Soul Search, which is a program that can literally find anyone in the world in less than 20 minutes. And if they're taking a dookie in the woods, 21 minutes. They use it to find an escaped convict in literally 11 minutes and since they have everyone watching online and even the people right in front of them, they decide to do another one and focus on finding one of May's ex-lovers, which this is the part where we roll it back and look back at the boyfriends that she had because the movie rushes on it, so it's not really like they make it that important, but she does have Mercer, who's played by Eller Coltrane from Boyhood, and this is the guy who she grew up with, but this guy is all about that Duck Dynasty life while she's going fully social, so they end up drifting apart. The book also has this other dude named Francis who 
really isn't in the movie, but there is the mysterious John Boyega character that nobody knows and he just looms in the dark. Back to the soul search though, they choose to search out Mercer who's living in a cabin in the woods and all these creepy people start looking for him Pokemon style. They follow his purchase records, his last sightings, and when they find him, the dude ends up gunning it in his car. Now here is where things end up differing because in the book, May actually chose to search him out instead of the people choosing him because she wanted to prove to him that this technology was so powerful and that when he noticed that he'd be like, all right, sign me up for whatever reason. In the movie, what we end up seeing is that they end up bombarding him and one of the drones decides to TP his windshield, ruin his sight, and he ends up crashing and dying off a bridge. What's crazy though is that in the book, he actually doesn't get into an accident. He decides to drive off of the bridge and commit suicide instead of having to deal with all of these crazy drones and surveillance that's going on. And that's his decision. Didn't even leave behind 13 tapes, so he's super selfish. Bogus Lee, though, they end up blaming him, kind of, so the circle doesn't get in trouble. They say that he was a troubled man who was very asocial and didn't talk to anybody, and that way they're able to wash their hands and continue doing whatever the circle's doing. Now, you would think that May, who just experienced this, would be like, all right, enough's enough. I gotta bring down the circle, but instead, she tries to help it out even more and have it grow even after realizing plot twist that John Boyega's character is actually the third wise man who helped create the technology to make this stuff happen. Why were they just letting him roam around free? Why didn't he use all the knowledge that he had to stop what he felt was wrong way earlier? I don't know, your guess is as good as mine. But what's even crazier is the fact that May decides in the movie to not only screw the two guys over by exposing everything that they had in all of their emails, so now they're just completely screwed, but she even screws John Boyega, who wants to completely have privacy and not have all the surveillance, it doesn't make any sense. Like the final images that we see in the movie is her just completely screwing over these two guys and then leaving John Boyega in the dark. She cuts away as if like, I don't know, the editor was missing footage to go in here, goes to white, and then it's her kayaking with drones above her. Now, because I read the book, I know that that's her decision of going, you know what, everyone's going transparent. And her final line is saying that the world cannot wait. So literally she has made the decision that privacy doesn't exist anymore. But the difference is that in the book, she's with Annie who's in a coma and she decides that the next step to advance the technology of the circle is to be able to read people's minds. So again, I have no problem if a movie tries to change up the things from its original source. No problem at all. I just wish that when they're changing things, they actually make them better. Because what ends up happening when you omit stuff from a story, you're just underplaying it, you're undermining it, you're weakening the original substance that you had, and I think it's a good story. I think that if they would have done the AMC, FX, HBO, 10 episode treatment, a miniseries would have been good. Instead though, I think the movie felt a little rushed, and instead of focusing on like what people's reactions were to this technology outside of the circle, I don't know, they focused like on a mini back concert that they had in the movie for no reason whatsoever. But even with the movie being choppy and having an ending where the main character literally just goes, screw privacy, it's all completely over, the movie still gives you a lot to think about and to discuss, which is what I really want to get into, because there's the idea that a lot of people put out there that the movie really reflects on America and our social media culture, and while I think it does, I think it goes beyond that, because there are characters like Mercer in the story who we're living like an Amish lifestyle, yet they were still affected by all of this technology. I feel that when you start dealing with technology at that level, it starts interacting with human rights, which is exactly what the movie tried to show. And one of the things that they really pushed in the movie was the idea that knowledge is a basic human right for everyone. And they want to get that out there through their technology. But the thing is, we do have that. We have technology that allows us to be able to know everything in the world we just don't. We literally have the entire universe, manuscripts, books, all of these theories, studies, all of these things that we can learn, but we usually go online to check out memes or funny compilation videos. And it's not to say that that's a bad thing, it just shows what most of humankind focuses on when they have these tools at their disposal. That leads to the next point of social media interaction and where we would rather 
socialize with people online than people who are actually in front of us, where the way that we're perceived with our online personas is one of the main priorities that we have over everything else. And I would highly recommend checking out the season premiere of season three of Black Mirror because that really paints a picture on what we're kind of heading to when it comes to our social interactions. Because the movie even has this thing where they deal with smiles and frowns. Again, it's more covered in the book, but it's that idea that if one country disliked another one, we have evolved to the online persona that we literally just swipe frown to that country and hope that that's what changes it. I don't know, it's weird. But I mean, when we really look at it, if you're watching this video, then that means that you have a device that allows you to go online. That means that you have some sort of persona online, that you have shopped for stuff, you have an ID, a profile out there. And that may leak one day, and thus there goes all of your information. And that, of course, leads to the main point that the movie brings up and that I want to focus on, and that's privacy versus freedom. See, I'm not the type of guy who believes in just choosing one side as if, like, politics or sports teams or something, because when you choose one side, you're ignoring all the positive that's in the other. See, I understand the idea for privacy because, I mean, I barely get enough sleep, so why would I want someone snooping around at 2 o'clock in the morning watching me? At the same time, though, on the other hand, you have the surveillance idea where everything is being monitored, but there's positives and being able to reduce crime and being able to detect issues before they arise even though you're giving up privacy. Of course, there's also negatives in where you have people taking advantage of doing things in the dark or people taking advantage of this powerful technology. But I mean, I personally, if I were to look into the future and realize that this technology would be able to help one of my family members from getting a disease, if it would prevent one of my family members from being kidnapped, to be completely honest, I would then look at that point in time and I would be asking myself, man, what could I do anything to prevent this? And I probably would sign up for allowing people to see me take a dookie because at least my family members would be safe. Does that mean everyone's gonna go that route? Of course not. Some people will never trust this technology and some people will always want privacy, but the idea that there's a concrete answer on which route is right is absurd because they're just different routes. Privacy, or this overbearing security. The real problem with both is humans because <laughs> humans are the ones who take advantage of that privacy and do messed up stuff in the dark. And it's also humans who take advantage of this security, the surveillance technology and do even more jacked up stuff. Both are just routes, they're different alternatives. Really, every time that there's these debates and people wanna choose one over the other, what we forget is that it's us as humans, us as flawed people who end up manipulating these things to our own messed up advantages. So to answer the question at the beginning, I do think people act differently when they're being watched. And for the most part, they act better. But I don't think that makes them a good person because their morality really is just on the sideline as they're acting for a camera. They really just don't want to be caught. Again though, you would never know for certain what you would do in the scenario, the same way that we always have these political differing sides where we argue for one point or we argue for another. And this main one being for freedom and privacy or security and surveillance. And the truth is, we'll never know which side would fully work because of our human flaws that will always have us going in circles.